This video is brought to you by World of Warships. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today... Hold on a sec. Hello? No, I don't want to hear about my car's extended warranty. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and today I'm at 17 Wing in Winnipeg having a look at a fascinating piece of Cold War military communications gear. This is an RT-159A or URC-4 aircrew survival radio. This was introduced by the Hoffman Radio Corporation in 1950 and was issued to American and Canadian air crews to communicate with rescue forces in case they were forced down. So these served during the Korean and Vietnam Wars and were also issued to air crews of Strategic Air Command, or SAC, especially those flying over the polar regions. But before we get into the fascinating history of this radio, first a word from this video's sponsor, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game that lets you take command of some of history's most iconic warships. Choose from over 600 battleships, cruisers, destroyers, aircraft carriers, and submarines from the legendary Yamato, Tirpitz, Iowa, and Dreadnought, to the more obscure Rio de Janeiro, Gritibis Unitis, and Mogador. Each ship is lovingly recreated down to the last detail, with key stats like top speed, turning radius, armor protection, and the time needed to aim and reload the guns accurately represented. Battle against a massive online community in more than 40 highly detailed maps with stunning water and weather effects that put you right in the heart of the action. With each victory, you unlock ever more powerful ships, allowing you to dominate the high seas. And with new content released every month, including in-game nations, ship classes, or themed maps like Transformers, Popeye, or Godzilla vs. Kong, there's always something exciting to look forward to. From November 16th to 30th, players can participate in a special in-game collaboration event between World of Warships and the popular anime High School Fleet. At registration, use the promo code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack including 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Link in the description. Oh, and did I mention World of Warships is also available on console? Now, I don't normally play a lot of video games, but even I have to say World of Warships is a ton of fun, and I love the sheer variety of historical warships that you get to play. So, what are you waiting for? Like Nelson, I expect that every viewer will do their duty. Now, while this radio might look very bulky and awkward by today's standards, for the time it was produced, it was actually a very impressive feat of electronics miniaturization, particularly since this entire circuit is based on vacuum tubes and not transistors. And when we open this up later in the video, you'll see that this is a very cleverly designed circuit indeed. But first, let's have an overall look at the radio itself, and I'll show you how it was meant to be used. So as you can see, the ANURC4 is made up of three basic components. You have the radio unit itself, you have a BA1264-U battery pack, the two being connected together by a CX1093A-U cable. So these were designed to be carried in an E1 aircrew survival vest, with the two modules being carried in pockets on either side of the vest to help more evenly distribute the weight. But despite the fact that this is a very compact and lightweight radio for its day, it is still very heavy. The radio weighs around 1.3 kilograms and the battery pack around the same. And something that was widely reported by pilots was that the shock of their parachute opening would cause the radio modules to rip out through the bottom of the pockets and be lost into the abyss, which I'm sure made an already bad day even worse. These could also be airdropped to a downed aircrew using a special parachute container, and in this form was often supplied with something called the MT609-U, which was a guy-wired mast to which the radio could be attached in order to increase its range. So the battery pack uses mercury cells and actually consists of two different batteries bundled together, one supplying 1.35 volts and the other supplying 136 volts. And we'll go over the reason for this in just a minute. It has to do with the way that vacuum tubes operate. But for now, an interesting fact is that the 136 volt battery simply consists of 100 of the 1.35 volt cells stacked together. Now, let's actually have a closer look 
at the radio receiver and transmitter itself. So this has a 35 milliwatt transmitter, which has a maximum range under ideal conditions of around 170 kilometers line of sight. Though under real conditions, if you're in a forest, if there are hills or mountains, it's going to be considerably shorter. So on the front of the unit, we can see our combination speaker and microphone. So as we'll see in a minute, this is set up as a simplex circuit, meaning that some of the internal components are shared between the transmitter and the receiver, meaning that you can't transmit or receive simultaneously. You have to do them alternately. And so when you are transmitting, this is going to act as your microphone. When you're receiving, it is going to act as a speaker. So if you look on the right side of the radio, we have our band selector. So this transmits at either 121.5 megahertz in the VHF or very high frequency band or 243 megahertz in the UHF or ultra high frequency band. And you'll notice that the UHF frequency is twice the VHF frequency. And as we'll see later, there's an important technical reason for that. Some of you might also have noticed this doesn't really correspond with the modern definitions of UHF and VHF with UHF starting at 300 megahertz. That's because this is based on an earlier U.S. military definition of those radio bands. Now, if we look at the other side of the radio, we'll see a row of three buttons marked Tone, Transmit, and Receive. Because this is a simplex circuit, you need to push the Transmit or Receive buttons in order to toggle between the two modes. Now, the Tone button, when pressed, emits a continuous 1000 Hz tone, which can be used as a homing beacon for rescue aircraft or in a pinch to send Morse code signals. Now this row of buttons also includes this little strip right here, which can be pushed in to lock any of the buttons in the closed position. And this is useful if you're on the move, say, or if you're injured or ill or otherwise incapacitated because it allows you to either transmit a continuous tone, monitor the airwaves, or transmit continuously without having to hold down the button. Now, if you look on the bottom of the radio, we have our jack for attaching our battery pack and cable, and we have a threaded hole for attaching that radio mast I was talking about, the MT609. And finally, at the top, we have our antenna assembly, and that's released by sliding back this white button. You then slide it up to its farthest extent, and then you can pull out and fold out the antennas. So these antennas can be extended to two different lengths depending on what frequency you're operating at. The shorter length is for the UHF frequency of 243 megahertz, which has a wavelength of 1.3 meters, whereas the longer length is for the VHF frequency of 121.5 megahertz, which has a wavelength of 2.47 meters. Right, so let's actually open up the case and have a look at the circuit. So as I said at the beginning, this is based entirely on vacuum tube technology, and there are eight tubes total in this circuit, labeled V1 to V8. So V1 is the oscillator, which works in conjunction with Y1, which is a piezoelectric quartz oscillator. And this produces an output frequency of 30.375 megahertz. Now V2 and V3 are doubler circuits, which together quadruple the output of V1 to produce an output frequency of 121.5 megahertz, which we'll recognize as our VHF frequency. While V4 is yet another doubler circuit, which doubles that frequency to 243 megahertz, which is our UHF frequency. So when you slide the frequency selector switch, you are either connecting V3 directly to the antenna for VHF transmission, or connecting V3 to V4 and then to the antenna for UHF transmission. Now, skipping ahead a bit, V7 and V8 are the first and second stage audio amplifiers, which amplify the audio signal from your voice when you speak into the combination microphone and speaker. And this amplified signal is fed through V3 and V4 for modulation, V3 being used for VHF transmission and V4 for UHF transmission. Now, since this is an amplitude modulated or AM transmitter, the frequency of the carrier wave remains the same, either 121.5 or 243 megahertz. However, the amplitude of that carrier wave varies depending on the input signal, that is the voice signal from the microphone. Now moving over to the receiver ends of things, this is wired up as a super regenerative receiver. And the regenerative circuit was invented in 1914 by American radio pioneer Edwin Armstrong. And later in 1922, he came up with the super regenerative circuit. But while the original regenerative circuit saw widespread use in commercial radios, 
the super regenerative circuit is rarely seen, except in specialized applications like this one, where you can take advantage of its extremely low parts count. So V5 and V6 act as the radio frequency detectors or demodulators, with V5 demodulating VHF and V6 demodulating UHF. These received signals are then passed through V7 and V8, which act as first and second stage audio amplifiers to amplify the signal and output them through the combination microphone and speaker. Now, another interesting detail is how the tone switch works. So when you push the tone switch, it connects a feedback capacitor, C22, between V7 and V8, creating an oscillator that produces a 1000 Hertz tone. And so a very cleverly constructed and efficient little circuit. So I mentioned at the beginning of the video that the battery pack integrates two different batteries, one supplying 1.35 volts and the other 136 volts. Now, this is because vacuum tubes require three different voltages in order to operate. These are labeled A, B, and C. The A voltage supplies the filament, the B voltage supplies the plate, whereas the C voltage is the grid bias. So in this battery pack, the 1.35 volt battery supplies the A or filament voltage, the 136 volt battery supplies the B or plate voltage, whereas the C voltage or the grid bias is supplied by grounding the B voltage to the chassis of the radio through resistors creating a voltage drop. These batteries could operate down to around 1.18 and 115 volts respectively, which gave you around 24 hours of continuous use, assuming a five minute transmit and receive cycle. Though of course, this depended greatly upon the temperature. Luckily, however, having a separate battery connected by a cable meant you could actually stick the battery inside your clothing to increase its temperature and its lifespan. Now, while the URC4 continued to be used well into the 1960s, it was progressively replaced in US military service with a number of more sophisticated radios, including the RT-285 slash URC-11, which was introduced in 1954 and featured a hybrid tube and transistor circuit. The RT-278 slash URC-10, which was introduced in 1962 and was fully transistorized. The ANURC-64, which was introduced in 1964 and was a one-piece unit without a separate battery pack. The ANURC-68 and the ANPRC-90, both introduced in 1968. And the PRC-112 series, which was introduced in 2000 and is still in use today. So the main advantage of the PRC-112 family of radios is that they integrate user identification capability. And this is a big problem with these older radios, is that if one was accidentally activated, there's no way of knowing whether or not it was a false alarm. And this led to many instances of precious search and rescue resources being wasted. The PRC-112 series also integrates GPS location capability, which makes it a lot easier for search and rescue forces to home in on. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and a big shout out to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more fascinating communications gear and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.